Cheers. Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Chase. He's a shot set, shot science guy number three. Um, this is shot science overtime number fifty-two, I believe. So that's a full year's worth of live shows that we've put together here. Um, but we just want to welcome you guys to the show and remind you that if you want to get your question answered, the best place to send it to us at would be our Twitter, and we are at Shot Science on Twitter, so we will be answering questions from there primarily, but you can also send us your questions in the chat um, for this video um, through the Google Plus or through Facebook, and we'll try to get to all of those, but we give priority to Twitter, and then we kind of go through the chat, and we try to get to everybody that we can. Uh, if we don't answer your question, it's not because we don't like you, uh, we just didn't get to it. But uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about a, a quick little topic, and then we'll get to your questions after that. So start sending us your questions, and uh, if you can, go tell your friends to show up because that really helps us uh, be able to bring cool guests in and have more uh, interesting things to talk about with you guys. So go tell your friends, and uh, hopefully we can get some uh, cool stuff going. Uh, okay, so our topic today is we want to kind of tell people ways to become a great shooter. So what are some things that are really important in, in do, being able to develop that? Well, you know, probably the most important thing is for you to develop uh, decent stroke mechanics and to understand uh, how to apply them and then practice a ton on them so that they become uh, pretty much a, uh, um, a matter of muscle memory. One of the things that happens to us sometimes is that we kind of do not take and, and really develop good mechanics and we hone or make um, the uh, all of these different mechanics that are not really up to par as the muscle memory and so we never really get very good in our shooting so we want to take and select uh, uh, some good mechanics and of course we would like to have you come to uh, shot science because we think ours are pretty good and pretty solid and you know we have a long history of a lot of really good shooters uh, that would attest to the fact they've been real successful with what we do and so once you kind of have uh, all of that working for you, then it can, breaks down into a matter of uh, practice, 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 and doing it in every day. One of the things that we also suggest is that you use our form shooting drills, um, that we've got two or three of them that we uh, use, and when we have those form shooting drills, or when you use those form shooting drills, you begin to use uh, the uh, uh, mechanics in a short distance, and get very good at them, and then after you've done that, then you move away from the basket a little bit and prove them a little further away. Uh, all of that is really key stuff for important shooting. Chase, what thoughts do you have on that? I think one of the biggest things is just focusing in on a couple elements of your shot and not trying to overthink too many of them. So, you know, when I go through forum shooting, I a lot of times focus in on some of the things that I've been struggling with. So that may be, you know, falling back or putting the weight in my heels as I shoot, or it may be you know, the, the fingers uh, that I want to feel the ball coming off of. So when I shoot, I make sure, you know, my kind of cue that I'm thinking in my mind as I'm going through form shooting is two-finger finish uh, or full extension of the arm or flop wrist. And um, not having too many of those things and trying to think about 50 different important elements of shooting, but just picking a few um, while you're going through the drill and going to the next uh, set of drills and thinking about maybe another set or maybe for the whole day, just thinking about these two or three things. Exactly. Um, but just trying to focus in on a couple of elements of your shooting, maybe areas that you've struggled on before, just to make sure that you're you're executing those couple elements correctly, and then you know hopefully help build up that muscle memory for those elements. Right. You know, oftentimes you get people who ask us this question: How do I change this when I'm I'm working on my shot? Well, uh, Chase just kind of laid it out there for you: is that you actually focus on those elements that you are struggling with, and you most of you probably will figure that out pretty quickly. And focusing on it means that you're having this mental uh, reminder as you're shooting, and you're having a visual reminder as you're shooting to make sure that you execute the ball the way it should be executed. And you know, one of the things that I I'm not really upset about when I'm working with someone on developing the shot, I'm not really too much concerned about whether they make the shot or not. More importantly, I'm looking at what are they doing with the mechanics of the shot because once we have the mechanics of the shot working for us, then we can start worrying about whether it's going into the basket consistent, uh, consistently, and usually it will. Yeah, you know, I, for me, I think one of the biggest things that really will help you become a great shooter is, <laughs> is the three kind of parts of practice that we always talk about 
And that's, you know, you put in your diligent work dialing in the form and making sure all the mechanics and everything are, are in place and part of your muscle memory. You do that through, like, form shooting drills, um, uh, just, you know, working on set shots and things like that where you're, you're actually thinking about those different things. And, you know, if you have some kind of hitch or something like that, those are the things that you're focusing on um, kind of working out of your mechanics. And then what you do is you step that up and you, you once you kind of get that kind of working for you, you step that up and start doing the game speed, game intensity stuff. Right. So then it's like you can actually perform those things under pressure. And it's not like you get into a game and you have to stop and do like some weird form shooting thing in the game because that's not obviously going to work. So you set it up so that you do the diligent practice, the game speed, game intensity practice, and then into actual pickup games and, and school games or whatever, and you get the experience there. And it takes all three of those elements to really build that up. And, uh, you know, one of the problems I see a lot of kids go through is that they, when they, either, sometimes they do it when they're just warming up or they're, or they're practicing or whatever, but they just do kind of this kind of casual shoot-around thing where, you know, maybe they'll do a couple layups and then they go out 20 feet away from the basket and they start, you know, throw, throwing up threes and just kind of joking around. But that's not very diligent practice. I mean, you're not really working on your form. And, uh, you know, the guys that are great shooters, like if you look at somebody like Ray Allen, he shows up like three hours or something like that before a game, and he's working on these game speed, game intensity sh shots even before the game. And it's not like he's just going around and shooting around. I mean, he is... He is you know, going through cuts, he's coming off of passes and stuff like that. Um, so you need to kind of really set yourself up for success by uh, diligent practice, game speed, game intensity application, and then, uh, you know, getting the game experience and stuff. Right. Right. right? Well, I think a quick fourth element to that is when you're not at, at the hoop or you're not around, just working on visualization of yeah. your shot, too. And, and you know, I... You know, laying in bed at night, just thinking about what closing your eyes and picturing yourself shooting the ball and, and focusing on those mechanics as you go through it, I think help really create uh, you know kind of some support for for those elements and really you know trying to picture yourself shooting the ball uh, in, in the way that uh, you know is the most appropriate mm -hmm. way to shoot it. So focusing in on you know elbow through the bottom of the ball and focusing on flop wrist and watching yourself shoot the ball in that way, I think is really an effective means too without actually performing it. Well, you know, it's been proven through studies, too, that the visualization, uh, like Chase is describing there, is almost as effective as some of the practice that you might do. And so um, I would second that as far as Chase is concerned. I think the mental rehearsal or visualization of, of uh, what your shot is or what you want it to be is real important. Yeah, and, you know, going back to what Chase said, too, if you're trying to cue yourself with too many things in your brain when you're trying to shoot, that is a great way to really kind of sabotage yourself. Um, so it's good to maybe have a cue, few keywords or keywords that you can use if you need them, but you should really put in the work beforehand before you start having to do that stuff in games and stuff. Like right. you don't want to be going up in your game and going, okay, i got to make sure that I uh, have my elbow in or, or whatever. You want that already be, to be in place, but if you're practicing it and everything too, you don't want to overwhelm yourself with like, Ten different elements at the same time. Maybe work on one and then kind of start to uh, incorporate that, and then work on some of the other things as you go. You know, there's another part of the shooting that that I think is really important too, and and that is uh, to make sure that you understand that you're not going to make every shot. Uh, a lot of players um, come across this idea that if I miss two or three two or three shots at the beginning of a game, then I'm off that day and I should quit shooting. Well, and the reality of, of the game is this, is look at it in the long term, that if you're a pretty good shooter, let's say a high school player, uh, they tend to shoot somewhere between 38 and 40 or 41 percent on three balls. That's a pretty good shooter. And um, that what that really tells you is this, is that over a span of games that, let's, let's, say, um, let's say you shoot 100 shots, that you're probably going to miss 60 of those shots and that you're not going to be perfect. And, you know, a, a young man wrote me a little message this morning. He said, uh, in my practice, I was making 8 out of 12, and then all of a sudden it was 3 out of 12. Well, that's really how shooting kind of goes, is that sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Chase will have some comment on this, on this one, I'm sure. But the other thing that's really uh, think about is that 
uh, just because you miss a shot doesn't mean that you should take and fold up your tent and stop shooting. Uh, the reality of it is, I can remember watching Chase play a number of times where he went zero for ten on threes, and I can remember one time where he went one for ten on threes. And then um, I remember watching him in a game in the Bahamas where he went nine for eleven in the first half. And so uh, you should not really rely or be uh, deterred from your shooting just because you missed two or three or four shots in the beginning. Now, the last thing that I will kind of say about that is, is this. When you are struggling with your shot, uh, I have this little thing that I always tell everybody and when we're going through shooting is that when you are stu uh, having some difficulties, focus on the finish of your shot. Focus on the finish because that's usually where most of the difficulties are. And focusing meaning that is it coming off the first two fingers? Am I get a nice flop follow through on? Uh, all of that is really important. So those elements right there when you struggle, focus on the finish. Any more thoughts on it? No, it's good question. Um, yeah, but I will also say this too: when you guys are trying to choose which elements to incorporate into your shot, you should always look at the logical reasoning behind them, but always be vetting the evidence that people give you for using those mechanics. Um, they should be things that that make sense and also help you make an efficient shot too. You shouldn't just do things to add in elements or because somebody says it's going to help you. You need to make sure that it helps make your shot efficient, which will help you make it more accurate. Um, exactly. So the more moving parts that you add into it, the more points that can go wrong. So. You want to make it simple. Make, Every, it simple. make it simple will help you uh, with pretty much anything in life. You don't yeah. want to make it more complicated. Okay, so let's go to the questions. Um, let's see. This one, we're going to go to Twitter first. So if you guys want to get your question answered, make sure you send it to us on Twitter is the best place. We are at Shot Science. You can also ask us in the chat or Google Plus or Facebook, but uh, Twitter is the easiest place for us to find it. So we pretty much get to all those. Um, okay, so this one is from... Marcin Dimsky, who is at M. Dimble on, on Twitter. He says, hi, I shoot a lot of threes now, but when I was smaller, my coach told me I can't shoot threes because it worsens my routine. Is that true? I don't know how it would worsen your routine. Um, I think the question, or where he's probably going with that, is does it break down the mechanics the shot, of the shot? Yeah, shoot break it before down. you're too strong, yeah. you're strong enough. Right. Well, I think, I think that for anybody that is trying to develop a longer shot or a deeper shot, you have to work yourself back. You can't just start shooting three-pointers yeah. and expect you're, that you're going to be great from that range. I, you know, start with something like the form shooting drill, master those closer positions, and just take a step back and then master that, take a step back. Eventually, you'll get to the three-point range, and you'll be ready to shoot that and have the strength developed because you actually put the work in to move yourself back. How old was this young man? Uh, I said when he was young. When he was younger. Was younger. Yeah. But, but I agree with that. I mean, I think the, yeah. the coach is probably in line with that. That I shooting agree. threes at a younger age is not something that you necessarily need to do. I think you right. can grow into that by, you know, learning to uh, shoot shorter shots and kind of becoming more skilled in that area. Well, until I think, until but, you develop the strength for it, yeah. But I think younger players uh, play games far too much anyways. I think there should be a focus in on skill development more than just scrimmaging and playing games anyways. So right. I think that's a probably probably good advice on that to focus in on the shorter range to build better mechanics so that when right. you're older and stronger you're not you know, have, having poor mechanics or shooting further out. Yeah, I mean like like I said, a lot of times you see people that are that are warming up before a game and a lot of times in youth basketball you'll see these guys that are third and fourth grade and they're out there winging up twenty five footers. When you know that's not really a good range for you to be working on. You should be working on things that are more within your strength, and uh, eventually you will get you will get there. You just have to be a little bit patient and work on those mid, more mid-range skills. Okay, so now we're we're going to go to the chat. This one's from Fresh Mofos, who says, "Hi, I'm a point guard. I can also play shooting guard and a small forward. Where should I position on the court? I get confused where to position on the court. I need your advice. Thank you." Um, well, that's an interesting question because if he's playing for an organized team, usually his coach is going to lay out for him where that needs to be. Uh, you have thoughts on that, Chase? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a pretty good answer. I think if you're playing 
pickup games. It's you know kind of wherever you find good spacing on the court. Right. Um, but you know that's something that probably should be focused in on by the coach and, and your team. But if you're just playing pickup games, it's wherever you can find good space uh, away from everybody else to have room to operate and, and obviously keep moving. You shouldn't be in one place the whole time. Right. You know, that's a key point uh, that I think is often lost in, in basketball for young players is the fact they don't know how to play without the basketball. And we've addressed that a number of times. And, and Chase brings up that issue uh, that is very impor important for us to understand how to play when we don't have the basketball. And he was talking about uh, movement. And there's different kinds of movement. Maybe we'll take and spend some time addressing that. I think we've talked in our, our videos about uh, moving without the basketball. Yeah, well, I mean, we have uh, the playlist, Moving it Without the Ball, which is like, doing the L cut, B cut, back cut, but it's generally just, or even in the post, flashing the post, or um, what was the other one? Um, I think that was it, flashing the post. But, you know, all of those things are, you should always be keeping in mind to keep moving because that creates opportunities for you and for your teammates because the defense has to adjust to your movement instead of you just standing there and being a super easy person to guard. If you're moving around, that helps. But, I, you know, for this guy's answer, I think, Maybe we should just go through real quick and just the generalization of, of where positions are. But just keep in mind that this changes all the time, especially as soon as a play starts or anything starts, or if your coach has a different plan for it. But in general, the point guard or the one is bringing the ball up the floor, right? right. And that's usually up through the, the top of the key, right down the court. The twos and threes are generally the shooting guard and the small forward, and they play on the perimeter, kind of in the wing position. Free throw line extended to the right. three point line, yeah. And then the four is the power forward. He kind of plays an in between where he plays a little in the post, a little on, on, the, the, on the perimeter, on the baseline. Um, and then the five is the center, and he's usually playing a lot in the post and you know flashing the post, uh, going from post or going from a block to block or going behind post, things like that. Um, but those are very general position points because well, that can change as soon as the ball comes up the floor, or if the or if the coach has a different idea of how to play those guys, he might play four out or something like that. So, well, even more importantly, that's a starting point. Yeah. Uh, and what usually happens is that because the coach has devised a particular scheme for uh, team movement, maybe you're going down to a set a screen and the other guy's flashing out and you roll off that and come back to the basketball. So it's not like you're in that spot uh, on a peg or on a chain and that's the only place you can go. So Yeah, so just keep in mind that uh, if you're confused, you should talk with your coach. I mean, that's the best thing that you can do. You yeah. Don't think that you can't talk to them about it and just kind of wing it. That's not the best thing to do. Well, that's really a great point you bring up. You know, one of the things that we were cautioning our guys the other day at practice on is that if you don't know, you need to ask. And if there's, it's not a disparaging thing if you don't know. Some guys can't remember very well what it is they're supposed to do, and so always ask. And, you know, it's not going to piss the uh, uh, coach off at all. He just, he'll, he'll be willing to step up there and really tell you what it is that he wants you to do. Right. Okay, so here's another question from Twitter. This is from Darcel. XIV, who was, who was at, at Darcel XIV on Twitter, they say, uh, Today I played basketball with my brother, but I couldn't score, so I, I know how to eliminate my player, how to shoot after dribble. Um, I, think, I think what he's kind of asking is how does he get some opportunities to score. I think, I think he needs to learn how to create space. You don't want to necessarily eliminate the guy you're playing against. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but might be effective. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe something more like neutralize or something like that. Um, but learning how to create space is probably, it's, it's a tough skill to learn, but that's like really where you are going to get the shots, open shots, open looks. Well, I think the interesting thing about creating space, too, is typically the only way to create space is by closing space. And uh -huh. uh, I know we have a video on creating space, which is probably something that you guys should check out um, because it's, it's really the only way offensively to get open in a one-on-one -on -one situation is by being able to close the space to create space to where you can uh, have, have almost a mini closeout situation uh, to be able to have the player in an unbalanced position where you can attack them either by coming back into them and creating contact for score or, or creating space to shoot. Um, but I think that's probably the the most effective and probably the best use of time would be checking out the uh, creating space video. Yeah, yeah, creating space and uh, dribble attacks. Uh, I mean, there's so many uh, jab step, diamond, uh, long one and one. Uh, the, 
all the offensive moves, I think we have a playlist for offensive moves on the front page of our channel. And if you check out those, those are specifically how to create space and get open looks. Um, but well, and the other one on that, <coughs> probably very focused to this question, is how do you... How, your, your brother is probably a fairly good defensive player, or, or maybe you need to work on developing your skills a little bit, but I think the biggest thing and the thing that people struggle most with when they have a more athletic player that they're playing against, maybe it's an older brother, um, is angles and taking poor angles in the attack. So I know we have a video right. on angles. That's a really important one that when you're attacking the rim, you really want to make sure that you're going north-south at the basket mm -hmm. to close that space as opposed to moving in an east-west or, or right-left direction. looping out or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to guard somebody in that way. So I think angles are really important in that. Well, you have to go along with that on the other side of it, uh, you know, players oftentimes take those round-off uh, routes to get to the basket because they don't want to initiate contact. Yeah. And so one of the things, Chase, would probably be good is just to comment, too, on how important contact is as an offensive player. And, you know, <clears throat> I think also... People need to keep in mind that things like changes in speed, changes in direction, um, like Chase said, uh, closing space to create space, those are like kind of the, the major themes of all of those moves. Um, if you're utilizing those and the angles, if you're util utilizing all of those, you're going to be in pretty good shape. You just kind of have to get those mentalities into your mind um, and be able to utilize them um, to be able to create the space. I mean, there's a ton of tools that you can use to do it, but those are like the overarching themes. It's the angles, uh, closing space to create space, changing changes of speed and changes of direction are really where you get it done. Yeah. Okay? Okay, so, uh, and check out that, that playlist, Offensive Moves, I think is what it is. Um, this is from Anthony P., who is at I Can Lay Up on Twitter. That's a cool Twitter handle. Uh, he says... Uh, I don't jump high when I shoot. Is that a problem, or is it fine as long as I feel comfortable and I keep making buckets? For me, uh, I think what is way more important is it being comfortable. One of the things that players oftentimes think that they need to jump higher. Well, you can only jump so high. Uh, you, you know, Chase can jump one elevation, I can jump another one, Casey another one. Really? But we can't. <laughs> Yeah, well, zero. well zero. 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 <laughs> zero. I, we start at zero right here. But the point is, is that you can't jump higher than you're capable of jumping. And if you if you try, what happens, the entire body tenses up. Yep. And when it tenses up, then your success on your shot probably is going to fall off really quickly. So what's more important for me is just being comfortable. If it's four inches or if it's 14 inches, what is comfortable is going to be the most effective thing for you to do. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that, Chase, or is that cool? No, I, think, I think that's right on. It's just comfortable, and, and uh, I, I wouldn't focus so much on the ball going in. Uh, I would focus much more on mechanics, and but, you know, obviously the ball going in is important. Yeah, and you know, uh, oh man, what was I just going to say? <laughs> uh, I, oh yeah, I think that the most important thing to remember is to learn to create space. You shouldn't be <clears throat> trying to out-jump your defender when you're trying to shoot. Because if you're trying to do that, he's probably going to beat you just because he's not having to go through the, the motion of shooting the ball or anything like that. Um, so if you're having problems getting a shot off and you think that jumping higher is going to solve that problem, you're probably, uh, you probably should look more into creating space so that you create uh, more of a distance for that guy to have to cover to get to your shot instead of trying to jump over him. Because that's, that's not really... Uh, a realistic thing to, to be able to develop quickly or uh, you know be able to put into place right away. So, <coughs> so work on creating space um, and, uh, and you'll be good. I, you know, in terms of like pro players too, look at somebody like Ray Allen. He jumps really high when he yeah, shoots. He but then look at somebody like Steph Curry. He does not jump super high when he is when he's shooting. Both are great shooters. It's just that they shoot at the height of their comfort when they reach the top of their jump. Yeah. So. Yeah. There you go. Um, this one is from Chaos2611, who has been around the last couple weeks like clockwork. He says, whenever I play a game with people, I can't drive to my right because they kind of push. Uh, any advice I heard about leaning into them? What do you think? Chase, this is all over you. No, I think angles is the big thing, and, and being able to take an angle on somebody to create that contact. And I think it, it really depends a lot on 
what kind of contact are they making with you? Are they chesting up to you? Um, are they putting their hands on you to, to control you? So I think those are really important things to look at. Uh, I'd say the first instance is if you take those angles and you're making body contact, that's great because you're able to close the gap to them and be able to create space, whether that's continuing to the hoop or separating and taking a shot. Um, I, I, what I would really focus in on is, is making sure that your skills are to the level that that's not going to throw you off. So you don't want to throw your body into them to where you're off balance. I think the biggest, you know, offensive uh, advice you can always take is stay on balance while you try to get your defender off balance, whether that's a jab step, a shot fake, attacking them, uh, you know, directly to where you're making contact. But you want to stay stable and controlled. You don't want to create such contact that you're leaning into them and then they move and you fall over uh, or, or you can't control the dribble because you're off balance. I, I think that's probably the biggest part of making sure that you create that, that differential. Uh, if they have their hands on you, they're able to keep that distance and you haven't closed the space. Um, if they use a forearm, there's, there's not much you can really do with that other than separating. If they try to put their hands on you or hand check you, I think you can knock the arm away and be able to kind of create that contact. We have a video on knocking the arm away. That's a useful one to look at in the uh, Offensive moves are probably in that playlist as well. The hammer, uh, yeah, yeah, the hammer. So, uh, so I think that's probably a, a useful piece of advice. But I wouldn't be afraid of contact. Just make sure that you stay on balance in any contact that you make. Right. Right. Um, and be aggressive. There's a mentality to it. There's yeah. a mentality that I'm not going to let anybody get in my way. But you know, doing that in a controlled manner is important. Right. Well, the other thing I think is real important when you're in that situation is that you be. <clears throat> that you be the person who is, is delivering the contact instead of receiving the contact. Because when you're receiving the contract, oftentimes you're knocked off balance, whereas if you are getting into them instead, you're going to be the person that's going to have more control and balance as you go. Well, I mean, just being aggressive and not playing to it, I mean, that's yep. really where it is. I mean, you shouldn't be too focused on the contact. Uh, just be focused on uh, being aggressive. Yeah, I think on that line, I, I almost disagree a little bit in the standpoint of creating the contact. Maybe it's just a perceptual thing or how, you know, the statement on that. Mm -hmm. But what you don't want to do is, is create contact by reaching or pushing or right. lowering a yes. shoulder. You want to find your line, which is directly to the basket, and take that line no matter who is in that direction. Um, and, and that's the kind of creation of the contact. A lot of times it's initiated by the defender because you're in a line and they end up trying to get in front of you right. and you, and you, you know, there's, there's a creation of contact there whether it's you or the defender but I think it's you know you don't want to create that contact by leaning or using a forearm or just running over somebody when they're dead in front of you you want to take a good angle um, <coughs> so that there is contact but you know not necessarily being well, and, and, you know, I think you also talked about being on balance and everything too. Yeah. One of the ways that you do that is by getting lower a lot of people try to. A lot of people I see try to attack the basket, and they're kind of straight up and down. If somebody gives you a little bump, and you're you're not you don't have to have a, low, a lower center of gravity. You're just going to kind of ricochet off of them. So if you're down low and you're on balance and you're attacking, uh, they might bump you, but it's not going to send you off course. So um, it's better to kind of have a lower center of gravity when you're working on attacking the basket and, and just dribbling in general, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the giggle well, all I, about? I, well. I got a little giggle here because I was just looking at uh, okay, you uh, can't. this item right here. <laughs> okay. okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, just don't forget it because... Okay, this is from uh, Darcel again on Twitter, uh, who has apparently changed his, his Twitter handle to at EdsonMVP, uh, who says, I would like to know how to increase my vertical jump. I'm 14 years old. Um, well, if you want to go check out our vertical jump videos, which feature Chase... Um, he's going to tell you specifically how to create uh, or how to develop your vertical jump. Um, and along with that, we have the Vertical Jump Handbook, which is three months of daily training that will uh, kind of lay out exactly the exercises that we think will help you develop your vertical. And, you know, the cool thing about the, the program that Chase put together is that it's really focusing just on body weight and uh, it's, it's safer for younger people to work on because, you know, it's not loading up a bunch of weight or focusing just on power. It's like a very comprehensive um, program that will help you develop your flexibility, your mobility, your stability, uh, your strength, and then also your power. But it helps you build up this uh, kind of foundation before you really get started into uh, 
you know, really pushing your body, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so check that out. Vertical jump series. Um, I think you could probably just search for vertical jump training on YouTube and it'll show up. But if you go to our channel page on Shot Science, it's right there. There's two main videos and then there's a few little offshoot videos that are in that playlist. Um, check those out. Get the vertical jump handbook and you will be good to go. Okay, so if you guys want your answer, your answer your questions answered, make sure you send it to our Twitter. We are at Shot Science. We're getting a lot in the chat, but uh, not so many on Twitter. So send them over. Um, this one is from Drumsy on in the chat who says, I want to be in the NBA when I grow up. I'm 10 right now. I'm really confident that I can make it to the NBA. The only thing that is in my way is I'm supposed to be short, like 5'9". What should I work on? Well, I would say... <clears throat> setting a goal of the NBA is great, but just keep in mind that, that is, that's a very large goal. So try to set di uh, some, some smaller goals, some stepping stone goals along the way, like making the eighth grade, or the junior high team, and then making the freshman team, and then making the varsity team, and then uh, maybe making a college team. I mean, you want to have these little stepping stones just so that you can make achievements along the way and you don't get completely demoralized because you, you're, you're setting this, this goal that is very high and very far away if you're 10 years old. Uh, but also, what you need to do too is change the mentality of worrying about your height because it doesn't matter who you are, you can't change your height. You might end up being 5'8", you might end up being 6'6", six, six. you never really know. Um, even if your family has a certain height, you, you might grow a little bit taller, you might grow a little bit shorter, you don't know. But what you can do is you can use the advantages you have of your height to your advantage. So if you're shorter than all the other guys you're playing against, you're probably going to be quicker, you're probably going to be faster, you're probably going to be more agile, you're probably going to be able to go places that they can't necessarily go. So focus in on working on those things and not worrying about being 6'8". Uh, but the other thing is, too, is if you're shorter, you're going up against taller guys, they're going to think, oh, here's a guy, I'm just going to swat him into the 10th row or something like that. Use that against them. So you get in there, give them a little shot fake, they're going to jump on the first attempt no matter what because they're going to you know, think that they can block you. Go up, get some contact, put the ball in the hoop, and you get an and one. So there, you have to think in, in advantages, not in disadvantages. Um, right? Yes. <clears throat> well, the last part of that, I agree with what you're saying, Casey. The last part of it, it says, what should I work on? Okay. Everything. Uh, my, my point of view on, on, on being a basketball player, you know, should not think of it in terms of position so much as being a complete player, that you have good ball skills, <coughs> you have good shooting skills, you have good passing skills, uh, you can defend, uh, and as you develop all of those skills, and as you grow and get older and mature, what's going to happen is that you're going to begin to work into a slot, particularly uh, on a team that the coach feels that you fit best in. And, you know, people are asking us, what should I do to be a better uh, post player? Well, and I'm, I'm only 12 years old. Well, one thing that you want to do is first be a basketball player before you start talking about position player. Be a basketball player first. And so develop all of those skills, work on them all the time. It's really amazing that maybe you're a little guy or a short guy uh, when you're 10 or 12 years old, but then all of a sudden you've got these great skills that you've worked on, and now you're six foot five and you've still got those same skills. You become a really valuable player uh, to most teams that you would be on. Yeah, I mean that would be like a Kevin Durant, Magic Johnson situation where, or Anthony Davis situation where you're just, uh, you know, you worked on your skills because you were, you know, maybe you thought you were going to be a short guy, but then you all of a sudden grew and you were six foot nine or something like that. Now you, you have point guard skills, but you can also go inside. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that's kind of what we thought on that, I guess. Okay, this is, a, this is a vertical jump question for Chase. This is from Chaos2611. He says, can Chase demonstrate the glute squeeze to me? I can't do it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 well, he, he actually he demonstrates it in in the video, the vertical jump video. Um, but uh, I mean, <laughs> what is what is the what is the basis for being able to do that? It's just being able to activate those muscles, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So now you've got it. I think watch the video and, and you see demonstrations of that. I think the biggest thing is just being able to 
contract and squeeze those glute muscles. Um, you know, we typically, I think, you use a bridge position where you're laying on your back and or lying on your back, and you try to lift your your glutes up and squeeze them together. But that's essentially glute activation. Right. Okay. So this is from Anthony P, who is at I Can Lay Up on Twitter. He says, "When I put in." When put in the situation that is necessary to fade away, how do I combine the movement of moving away and going straight up? <coughs> Our favorite, the fade, fade away. <laughs> um, I think it's such a small use case in basketball, uh, or it should be at least, that I wouldn't really focus in on, on fade away. I'd yeah. focus in on the mechanics of shooting. I think a lot of times people try to kind of determine those, uh, those game situation that come up in, in such a small percentage of time and try to practice them when that's, I, I don't think probably an effective use of time. I'd focus on the mechanics first. Right. Um, you know, there may be a time where the shot clock's running down and you're, you know, have a big guy on you and you're trying to just get a shot up, but there, it's such a small use case that I focus much more on the mechanics than practicing a fadeaway or, or anything like that. Exactly. It's just Fade not worth your time. Right. Fadeaways are low percentage shots, any way you shake it. And, uh, uh, I agree with Chase's uh, description there of why spend the time on it. It's, you, sh you just don't come into that situation that often. Yeah, what well, I would say too, if you look at a fadeaway or any kind of shot where there's any kind of directional uh, movement, uh, since you're trying to hit a stationary target, you should work on trying to be as stationary as possible when you're shooting so that you, you know your ac accuracy will go up. Because any kind of movement in any direction is going to be a variable and it will affect the accuracy of your shot. So. If that's the case, you know it's going to be lower percentage. You should work on putting yourself into situations where you don't have to use those type of things. So going back to creating space um, uh, and working on getting open looks is the best way to go. But also, I would say, if you are a good shooter and you've worked on your mechanics and you have everything kind of firing for you on that front, you could probably step in and do a fadeaway and have those mechanics kind of still be there uh, without much effort. Um, it's the people that don't have their regular shot kind of in place that then go and try to shoot fade fadeaways as a, like a regular thing where that doesn't make much sense. If you have a good shot, good shooting mechanics, and if you are forced to shoot off balance or something like that, you will probably be able to get by if you have those in place. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the most important thing to realize is any time that you're falling away or leaning away from the basket or your directional <laughs> movement is backward or side to side at all, your percentage on that shot is going to go way down no matter what the shot is yeah. or what level you're at. It's just... Well, I mean, that's like Dad. He always says, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to shoot a gun and you're running or something like that, or if you're moving when you're trying to shoot a gun or, or whatever, good luck trying to hit that target as accurately as if you were just standing there and pointing at it, right? Yep. Okay, so let's move on. Um, this is from Dustin Lau. He says, can I send you a video of me shooting so you can help me fix it? Sure. Just send, it to us, us send it to us on Facebook is probably the best place. And we'll try and get to it right away as soon as we get it. Uh, here's from Major Ken, 9 man who says, Have you heard of the hop and sway on shots? Uh, do you think that shooting with your dominant foot in line with the hoop rather than ten toes to the basket? Okay, let's hit all of these things. <clears throat> we Let's just say this first, though. There's going to be different opinions on how to shoot and shooting mechanics and different methodologies. We are not uh, out there to discredit anybody. We think that if, if somebody puts in the work to build their shooting ability, they will probably be, you know, okay. But we've worked on developing our methods because we've taken a logical approach to it. We look at uh, refining the shot so that it's super efficient, and we eliminate all the moving parts that don't need to be there. Um, and all those things that will be a variable that will help that will degrade your shot and make you less accurate. So um, I'm just gonna we'll just go through it each thing. When when you're talking about the dominant foot in line with the hoop, so you're talking about being a little bit turned, a little bit staggered towards the hoop. We 100% believe that. We don't think that you should be 100% squared up to the basket because you're shooting from one side of your body, probably so, off your shoulder as well. Yeah, so what, if you go and look at our videos, we have a video <coughs> called uh, Don't Square Up to the Basket or something like Don't Square Up When You Shoot. And it's basically telling you that 
you want to have this, this slight stagger towards your shooting side. So your shooting side foot should be a little bit forward, which will pull your shooting side hip a little bit forward and your shooting side shoulder so that you're a little bit staggered. The one thing we will say about that is that you don't want to be doing that as you're going up into the shot. You want to have that set in place with your feet before you even start the upward motion into sure. your release, right? right, right. Um, okay, then this they are asking about the hop. We don't believe about hopping into your shot because it's not going to be as stable as if you're stepping into it, but most importantly, it's not going to set you up for having good rhythm into your shot because if you're stepping with a one, two, and up or a stop gather uh, footwork, it's not going to give you that rhythm that that's going to give you. And the other thing that I think is really important is that when you're hopping into your shot, you're going to be going from high to low to high, whereas if you're stepping into it, you're going to be going low to high. So you're eliminating this kind of up and down movement, and it's just going to be more stable, more efficient, right? Right. Well, one of the other things that's a part of that uh, is this, and that is if in that uh, using the stop and gather method, which is one, two, uh, lead foot, trail foot, there's, it's called a lot of different kind of things. If we are executing that and getting ready for a shot, and for some reason we're not able to execute and need to counter, we still have that ability mm -hmm. to do that. Right. If you are hopping into the shot, you're done. You're yeah, done. well, here's the thing is if you're hopping and you're in the air, you cannot go anywhere until you hit the ground again. True. Right. Yep. So if you're down and you're still, I mean, the thing about stepping into it is that you're also preparing for your shot before you catch it or pick up the ball. So you're down and uh, you know you're you're even before the ball is in your hands, you're stepping into the shot. You're generating rhythm before the ball is even in your hands. It's going to be way more efficient, way quicker than if you are already catching the ball and hopping and being in the air, and then have to go down and back up. And when you do that, uh, you're going to have a faster shot without having to rush your release. Right. And you know, people are always looking for, how do I get my shot quicker? How do I get it off faster? Blah, blah, blah. The thing is that you don't want to do is you don't want to rush your release because you'll have uh, tension that you're adding to the ball. You, don't, you want it to be the same every single time. And if you have all this stuff in pre-preparation that's kind of going on uh, before where you can eliminate these steps in your shot, that's going to make it faster, more efficient, and get off faster, right? Right. Now that is the way, that is the method that we think is effective. Jason, okay. Thoughts on that? Yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, I think a big piece of that too is when you hop at any point, you commit to a shot. Right. Exactly. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with hopping in general. Is yeah, it takes a lot of time, but you're also committed. So when you start to hop, it's it's essentially a telegraph that you're going to shoot the ball. There's no counter to hopping. You can't hop and then cross over and make a different move. Right. So it really limits what you can do offensively when you step and, and you know one two into a shot or you know even even off the dribble hopping, you know, you're committed to that shot. And so I think the one two gives you an opportunity to just be a more um, a more aggressive offensive player from the standpoint of being able to, to shoot from the one two and build rhythm that way or being able to counter that and, and create a better opportunity uh, or create space, and you're just much more of a threat in a one-two position than right. the commitment of hopping. Right, and, and here's the other thing, too, is that I mean, I've mean i seen where they, they've talked about hopping in the shot. It gives you the ability to go either way with either foot, like you have an established pivot foot. Um, but I would say that it kind of it, it does it doesn't really help you in that way because I mean if you're if you've gone one two into the the, the pass and you're you know you're looking like you're gonna go go into a shot you can go with your your top foot you can go over the top but you can also cross step and go down so it's not like you've eliminated that and doing a cross step uh, you know it's that is actually probably more dangerous than doing the just the over the top step with the top foot. Um, because you're sealing yourself and the ball between uh, where the defender is, so it's it's a little bit harder to guard that. And you know, I don't think that there's less value in being able to do that. So uh, you know, I I would I think that the the one two stop gather footwork is really going to help you pretty much in every single way that you look at it. Right. Um, and when you hop into that shot, you you're picking up your dribble. So you well, well you're that's, that's that's if you're dribbling into it, but if you're catching it or whatever, that might be a different situation. Where you hop into it as you're catching it, Jimmy? Yeah. Hmm, maybe. But but maybe. I still think that 
benefit of the one two is that you can you can go in either direction again, yeah. but you've also established the shooting rhythm and you've cut out a little bit of preparation and you're not going high, low, high. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the big point that Casey made is is you know, again, <laughs> the whole point of uh, being an offensive player is getting your defender off balance while you stay on balance. And you're not on balance when you're hopping because right. you're coming out of your position, coming back down into your position, and, and maybe you don't go to shoot, but at that point, you you know have created a situation where if you catch if you're hopping into your shot and you catch the ball, you're going to start in an unbalanced position. The defender yeah. can be in you and push you off your point. If you step one two, you're essentially creating a bigger bubble of space around you that that defender has to respect in that way right. because you're low in that position. So if you catch the ball one two and attack off the dribble, you've never come up. You've stayed low the whole time. And it's much more efficient, and it's, it has to be respected by the defender than if you get off balance, hopping, and then try to gather with the ball, and then the defender is, you know, any good defender is just going to, you know, take advantage of you in that situation without a doubt, and you're going to be caught off balance, and you're not going to be able to make a right or left move because they're, you know, against a weaker defender, they'll probably be off you and they have that ability. But when you start playing at higher levels, you just you can't do that effectively. Right, and I think, but I think the biggest element of it is just the efficiency of it. It's not as efficient. High, low, high is not as, as efficient as low to high, and you can and you can go out of it either way doing the, the step through. Right. Um, and then this the sway thing with the feet. Um, you know, people are are saying that you know swing your feet out is is going to help you relax your upper body, um, but you know. In general, that is not how biomechanics work. You don't, you know, tense up your lower body to release the tension in your upper body. Um, essentially, what when people see that happening, what's happening is that you're going up, you're shooting, your shooting release is going to go forward and, and out, and so your lower body will have to kind of subconsciously compensate for that just because of physics. You know, you're changing your your center of gravity and your balance and everything, and so that's going to make it look like you're actively swinging your feet out. You don't want to do that when you're going up in shot and actively kick, kick out your feet because you will be adding tension to your overall body. The way that you release, relieve tension in your body is by actively telling yourself not to fire those muscles, right? Yep, um, and relax. Yeah, and shooting straight up and down is how you're going to be extremely accurate with your shot because if you're moving in any direction, whether it's leaning back or kicking your feet out, you're adding in a directional variable, which is going to have the potential to uh, to have something go wrong or degrade your shot. So, you know, we think that you shoot straight up and down. As soon as you explode off the floor, your legs essentially disengage and they just dangle there. there there's no real thing that they're supposed to do or anything like that, and you just focus on having a nice relaxed upper body release and uh, focus on finishing very uh, relaxed as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you fall, if you, if you come down and you land six inches in front of where you shot, that's fine, I guess. Yes, um, you know, there, you just don't want to be lunging or, or jumping feet forward or anything like that. You want to try to be straight up and down and just relax your whole body. And you don't do that by activating other parts of your body. Right? I agree. I agree um, totally. But I think the biggest thing to really focus in on there is, is you know, the more moving parts that you have, the right. more you're going to throw off your, your form. So if you can think about two or three really key important things, that's that's important. You know, I think you know, probably there's quite a few of you who have filmed yourself doing uh, different basketball moves, right? And maybe you had a friend film it or you filmed a friend. What's the easiest way to take a very nice picture of that person? It's to be as stable as you possibly A tripod would be great, right, because it's very stable and you can get a great picture. The same thing's true for shooting. Uh, you know, I think any time in a game you're going to have even professional players who are somewhat off balance when they take their shot. And right. There's going to be a correction biomechanically where they try to stabilize themselves either with their feet or, or you know, a core strength stabilizing or whatever it is. But, you know, I think the evidence is in... What are the most? What are the highest percenting highest percentage shooting places on the court that are not layups, but where you're actually shooting? You know, using shooting mechanics. Where would you say the highest percentage is? 
Um, what distance are you talking about? Or local any time in basketball where you use your shooting stroke to shoot, where's the highest percentage in any basketball? Top of the key? Well, free throws. <laughs> right? Free throws, where you're right. completely throws, still, yeah. and all you're focused in on is just the mechanics of the upper That's body. That's true. That's which true. is everything else is still, there's no lower body. The highest percentage is shooting free throws, just focused well, there's on... Well, no, there's no lower body, like, movement. It's, it's, right. it's lower body right. extension. Right. You're not you're not jumping and shooting. It's not a jump shot. You're just fully focused in on the stroke of your upper body being nice and still and relaxed and right. finish. And you have that's where you have the least moving part. That's true. Is in free throws, and that's why you shoot the highest percentage. Yeah. So I think really using that adage to try to extrapolate that to three point shooting or off the dribble shooting right. is really important. That the more you can eliminate the lower body uh, from the standpoint of having to think about different mechanics there and just work on. Yeah. You know the important pieces of, of the uh, you know shot stroke and, and the mechanics of just shooting is probably the most important. Piece. Yeah, and I would say that finally we'll, we'll cap it at that. I mean, we we could talk about this stuff probably all day, but I will say that you know a lot of people claim that when they start using these different elements of the shot, that suddenly they are these incredible great shooters. Um, I would say that's probably an exaggeration. But if you put any amount of work into your shooting. It doesn't matter if it's even kind of semi-wonky mechanics or whatever, you will get better. Because if, if you're just putting the work in, you will start to attenuate and make the adjustments just subconsciously to make you more accurate because that's what you're actively trying to do. That's why people like uh, Reggie Miller or uh, uh, Kevin Martin or whoever is somebody that has kind of weird mechanics, that's why they're able to overcome those mechanics and make it work for them because they put the work in. So if you are putting the work in and maybe you use some of these, these other skills, yes, you're going to get better because you're actually working on those things. So uh, I would just, for me, and I know you guys too, that it's probably the reason that you build your mechanics around efficiency is because it's very repeatable. It's something you can do all the time. It's going to be a little bit faster and there are less things that can go wrong. So we always look at efficiency as being the key for shooting. You want to make it efficient. Right. Right? Right. Okay, let's lightning round because we, we went <laughs> off on that one. Um, this is from Awesome Cohen. Hi, Coach. Happy Shot Science Sunday. Um, right. Let's see. This one is from Chaos2611 again. Also, does shooting on your back help with your shooting? Since it's in the winter now, I'm sure everyone would want to know this answer. Thank you. Laying on your back and shooting. I, I would just focus on the mental part of it. Yeah, the, uh, thank you. Focusing on mental rehearsal. Yeah, mental rehearsal, imagery, and uh, probably standing and shooting is a better. Yeah, thing. I mean, I've seen. <laughs> I guess you have room to, or on your knees, or something like. Yeah, that. I've seen a lot of people do the back thing, and I think you know, I guess it's just working on your release. But one of the really important parts of having a good fluid shooting mechanics, or having good shooting mechanics, is is working on connectivity between your feet, your legs, your your midsection, your arms, and your final release. So work on that. You know, get out in your living room or something like that, and just work on the full body extension of it uh, instead of just laying on your back. Because you, if you're if you're doing these segmental things, you might build in the segmentalism into your actual shooting. Right. Which, if you do that, you'll have these sticking points where you lose power at every one of those. Well, there's another point to laying on your back and extending your arm up. Uh, that's not how you shoot a basketball. Yeah. In basketball, you're actually elevating the ball, and so I don't think that's really a good practice laying on your back and, and yeah, push I, the ball up. I just don't think like, it's a good one-to-one -one tra translation. Really. No, and I think your comment there is the fact that you might just work on that just on your, your uh, wrist release. Maybe that's okay, but otherwise I go along with what you guys are saying. Yeah, I would just do the full body uh, motion. motion. Why not? And, and I, I really go along with what Chase is saying about the mental rehearsal and visualization. I think that really is a great way to uh, make progress. Hey, you're better off just taking the ball out of scenario. Well, you can do so that, too, and, and it can be very effective. Have, if you don't have root fight or whatever to be able to actually shoot it, just right. focus in on the form itself. Or just, you can, like, step outside for, like, for like 30 seconds, no matter how cold it is, and do it, and then run back inside. Right. Um, okay, this is, uh, this is from uh, El Conquistador, who is at Just Ask Bar on Twitter. They ask, uh, as a shooter, do you aim for the back of the rim or front of the rim? Well, that's an interesting uh, question, and one that, that we uh, we kind of chuckle about. Remember, we're in the lightning round, so yeah. Okay, quick, quick. Uh, I'll do this really quick. 
Uh, one of the things that you can do is if you figure that the back rim or the front rim is going to be your target, uh, then you're probably going to miss the shot more often than you make it. Uh, and the reason for that is that usually our shots tend to be a little flat unless we have developed that arc. And when we hit that, that back uh, iron, the ball is coming right back and we're, or going right back to where it came from. Same thing pretty much with the front iron. And that's why we never use that as a target. I think that target probably has been kind of a uh, historical uh, uh, landmark so for shooting for so many decades. Well, I think it's just because it's so easy to visualize. It's I'm easy. Well, and, yeah, and people can see that. And if you hit it, you can pretty much figure it's not going to go in. So, Well, if you do hit it, it's not going to go in. That's what I'm saying. Most if you do time. hit it, it's probably not going to go in. So what do you think is the actual target? Well, the actual target, target for us is, is uh, the inside of that rim. And uh, some people say, well, I can't see that. Well, yeah, you can because it's got a ring all the way around it. And that's where you're trying to put that basketball yeah, you just have, shoot it. You just have to soften your focus a little bit and visualize, okay, if you're throwing darts at a dartboard, right, there's a bullseye, take that dartboard and just lay it down on top of the rim. That's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for that bullseye because if you hit the bullseye <coughs> – on uh, if it's laying on top of the rim, it's going to go in every single time. So it might take a little bit more of a visualization for you to do that, but if you get in the habit of doing it, it's second nature, and that's where you want to hit. Yep, exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, okay. <coughs> and the other thing too is that if you think about it, if you're shooting from different positions on the on the court, you have to adjust to you know oh, I got to hit this part of the rim. I got to hit this part of the rim too. If you if you have that visualization of I'm just hitting in the middle. That's it's the same pretty much anywhere you go. Right. Okay. Uh, this is from Anthony P. I can lay up on Twitter. He says, uh, "What do you guys think of big men, especially in the NBA, slowly rotating up to the three-point line instead of posting up?" You know, uh, there's the typical. Um, um, I'm not sure of the right word I want to use here, but what has happened is that there are so few true post players in the NBA that even some of the people who are playing the post really are converted from the perimeter. And uh, that's why they're able to step out and shoot from there. I think it's fine. Uh, it would be great if you had a great center like uh, uh, Bill Russell or somebody like that, uh, but not every team has anymore because the post position, even in the college level, uh, of a true post player, one who can actually take the ball in the post and score effectively with it, there are just not very many of them there anymore. And I'm not sure why. I think that probably the game has kind of uh, uh, got to another uh, uh, another spot in history where maybe uh, the game is too fast for all that. I'm not really sure the reason for it. Well, I think it, is. I think it really just um, – it, it, that shouldn't really matter. Uh, you know, players should essentially be playing to their strengths. You know, if, if that's where it's at, then that's where they should be playing. Um, you know, what does happen is when you have a really solid – uh, post player is that it kind of pulls the defense away from the from the perimeter players and gives them a little bit more yep. space to operate. It does. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of a major. Uh, I don't know. I I, well, I, think, take, I think it's true that there isn't really too many. No, there's not. Centers. You take a guy like Chris Bosh, who's I think what seven feet or seven more. It's like six eleven, I think. Okay, and uh, there's a guy who steps away from the basket, and he can effectively shoot it from beyond the three point line. And and uh, yet, if you put him in the post, he probably wouldn't have much. Uh, he wouldn't be very effective there. And so I just think that there's, and I read this as well, is that there's there are very few true centers in the NBA today, and there are probably even fewer in the college level today. Yeah, true centers. What? Well, Go. No, I think it's a it's part of the evolution of the of the game too. I think yeah. is when you have those big centers, a lot of times they clog up space. I think that yeah. was one of the things that you know Shaq struggled with at the end of his career. Is he'd come to a new team and then it would stagnate their offense because he's sitting there in the right. middle and, right. and constantly running into it. So for guys like LeBron and Dwayne Wade, is you know somebody like Chris. Chris Bosch is a good pairing because he's not in their way. He can space out to short corner or high post and right. be able to catch and hit those mid-range shots where he's out of the way of those guys attacking the basket, which exactly. seems like it's much more where basketball has gone to, which is attacking um, off the dribble as opposed to set offense where we're going to try to get it into our you know, shack type post player, for, right. you know, drop step or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, I think too, a lot of people get stuck in the, the nostalgia of, of the way that things should be, but I mean, you, you, 
there's the, the game is going to evolve because it has evolved, you know, since the very beginning. That things are going to be a little bit different, and what people should really focus on is what is the most effective way to get things done. And getting things done means putting points on the board. And if that means not having a true center, then I mean that's just the way that it's going to be. Right. Right. All right. The major lightning round now. Um, <laughs> this is from uh, Oganaya. Ukwara, who says, can you break down the movement of the wrist during a jump hook? Also, how do you stay active on the post while avoiding the three-second rule? Okay, quickly, break down the wrist movement of a jump hook. It's the same, essentially, as a regular shot, right? It is. And it so is. you're just working on having that full uh, wrist flop at right. the top. And the ball comes off. You can't see this uh, where I'm demonstrating, but the ball still comes off these two fingers. Finish and to if, the rim. If I'm shooting at the rim, my hand is always behind the basketball, directly behind it, so I can finish with that flop of the wrist. With a nice arc, just like you would if you were shooting a, 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 a regular shot. Right. And then uh, this question about moving or keeping active in the post, uh, you know, that's something that you kind of learn to do. Check out our video called Flash in the, Flashing in the Post, I think is what it's called. Um, but what you want to do is just kind of be moving and looking to uh, seal and get and, and uh, kind of move towards the ball and, and hit the openings and hit the, the, the spots where the, the defense has a hole or something like that. Sure. Uh, go high to low, low to high. There's a lot of different things to do. Just don't stand there because you'll be easy to guard. And your man helps out on defense a ton, too. Okay, this is from Nicholas Van de Poot. Or Pute, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I apologize. He's at Nicholas Ja on on uh, Twitter. He says, "How important are your muscles for playing basketball? Core, upper body. Think about Kevin Durant's body, and then Blake Griffin." You want to take that, Chase? Sure. I mean, I think you know, taking that comparison, you don't really like Kevin Durant is incredibly strong and athletic. He just doesn't look like it because he's kind of longer and leaner. Um, you know, I think obviously strength is important in basketball, but it's not as visually obvious as you might think it would be. So well, Kevin Durant is super explosive. Yeah, uh, I, I, there's different types of muscle fibers and different types of body types, so strength and core stability are really important elements to basketball, but I, it, you don't visually see that as much as you probably would just by looking at a muscular guy. Like, you know, Shaq is obviously stronger than Kevin Durant, but Kevin Durant is much quicker, more explosive, more agile. So there's you know, lots well, of Well, I, I would say that you need to look more at skills as being the kind of trump card to um, your your strength and, and stuff like that. Because if you look at some at someone like Kevin Durant, sure, he might not be uh, in the physical uh, power uh, kind of classification as Blake Griffin, but his skills are going to way far outshine someone like Blake Griffin. Yeah. And that's probably just because Kevin Durant has put in the work to develop those probably more than Blake Griffin has because right. Blake Griffin has probably relied more on his athleticism and size than uh, someone like Kevin Durant. So uh, your skills are really what's going to push you to the forefront more so than developing your body. So, you know, I would say work on that more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you doing all right on time? Maybe a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll get out of here. Um, okay, we already answered that one about squaring your shooting hip and shoulder. Uh, we don't believe in that. Uh, you should have a slight stagger. Um, this one is from Hummus Man Two, who says uh, our coach told our team to stop shooting threes, and if we did, we would be benched the whole game. We are about thirty percent for the season, but my game is. Just shooting three. Should I try attacking the rim and risk turning the ball over? I'm not a strong dribbler, or just not look to score at all. Well, your coach is is the guy that makes the decision, um, and you know the thing is is that if you're not able to do kind of all the things in basketball that you should be able to do, then you'll be in a situation like this where you're kind of out of luck. Um, you need to be able to be able to shoot and be able to attack the basket. For this reason, and also for the reason that if somebody is guarding you, and they know you're a great shooter, they'll just crowd you, and then good luck getting your shot off then. But if you're able to attack the rim as well, then they'll have to uh, honor that and play off you a little bit more, and that'll give you more space to figure out what you want to do. Right? I'd say the easiest answer is you've got to honor what your coach is saying because right. he's the coach, but work on use as an opportunity to work on some of your other skills that you're not as, as good at. Right. 
Right. Uh, let's see. This one is from Constantinus Etta, who is um, 14 years old, 5 foot 10. Um, and to shoot mid range is easy for me, but then I'm shooting from three point range. It's hard to make. Uh, I make a lot of air balls. Is my height uh, is my height a big aspect for shooting, or do I need to jump higher? Thanks. No, 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 no. One sentence. All right. <laughs> Go to our video. Uh, make the three pointer. Uh, get your legs into it. That will answer that question for you. Uh, okay. Last question we're gonna do. Uh, let's see. This one is from Nadir Morgan, who says, "What exercises help with jumping and speed?" Also, I'm 6'5 and I'm 16. Should I start playing on the wing? I'm 190 pounds. Okay, I'm going to answer the last part first, and then I'll let you do the second part. Okay, um, when well, you're asking about your height and your age and, and weight and stuff like that and where, you should, <coughs> and where you should be playing, I will tell you again, I think we said it earlier, but you should work on being a great all-around player, not a position player, because if you just focus on being a position player, you can find yourself not being in the game because maybe there's a guy that's better than you at that position or whatever, or maybe the coach has a different idea of where you should play. Um, you should just work on being a great all-around player um, and not let your height or physical attributes dictate where you play. So work on that. And then he's asking, what exercises help jumping and speed? Yeah, I mean, I think check out the videos that we have on vertical jump, and I think we have some videos on dot drills yep. and foot speed and things like that, but that's what I work on most is... Dot drills, foot speed drills, vertical jump drills, and then probably stuff like jumping rope. And you know, there's a yeah. lot of little things you can do. I think, again, there's not any perfect science to what you should be doing. Yeah. Just um, you know, committing to just what you're doing to work on it. Yeah, just working on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna end it there. If we didn't get your question, we're very sorry, but you can come back next week, and we will be here Sunday at 1 p.m. to answer your questions. Uh, you can also hit us up on. Twitter, uh, we are at Shot Science. Uh, Facebook, we are there as well, Shot Science. Uh, Google Plus, we have a lot of cool stuff there every day, a lot of people over there talking about basketball. And obviously, subscribe to us on, on YouTube and watch all of our videos. Make sure you check out our videos that we just did uh, this last week that are using the Phantom Camera, super slow motion stuff. Um, and we have more of that coming out as well. But if you guys could go out and share that, that would be great because we want to get more people to see that stuff. And the more people that see it, uh, the more we'll be able to use that camera and get some slow motion, super slow motion basketball stuff on there. Um, Chase, where can people uh, reach you on Twitter or something like that? Yes, yeah, so my Twitter is at Chase Curtis. Um, that's probably the best place to reach me. Yeah. Think. Cool. Okay, so we will see you guys next week. Uh, hope you have a happy new year. And would you like to add anything? Yeah, thanks to Chase for being with us today and hope you all have a great new year. Yeah. All right, guys. Catch you later. <laughs>